I was invited to give a presentation on a subject I called very intriguing and multifaceted. I was asked to share my perspectives on the subject of ontological security, gender economics and international relations, with a focus on the ontological security of international relations. Relying on my international relations and security background, I address the nexus between ontological security and the practice of international relations in the Jamaican context. With a history of punching above its weight, isn't Jamaica that confounding paradise in the Caribbean? I am Ambassador Curtis Ward, and this is Real Talk. We are now going to hear from the international relations perspective. Um, that leads us to our next speaker, Ambassador Curtis Ward. Many of you uh, would have read his writings in The Gleaner, and um, he has a podcast. Uh, those of you who follow his podcast. Um, but he's a very distinguished um, public servant, Jamaican public servant. Uh, he's a former ambassador of Jamaica to the United Nations. He spent two years on this UN Security Council. He's an attorney at law and an international consultant specializing in national and international security law and policy, <clears throat> counterterrorism, legal and operational international sanctions, um, rule of law, governance, et cetera, et cetera. This is a very distinguished um, son of the soil. Um, and we are now going to turn to him to hear more about the, the nation state aspect of ontological security. Because even though it was defined initially in terms of the self, there's a sense in which it is also, the concept is, is also deployed in the discussion of the nation state. So over to you, um, Ambassador Ward. Thank you, sir. It's a pleasure being here. The subject of this seminar, Ontological Security, Gender, Economics, and International Relations, is very intriguing and multifaceted. I assume I was asked to participate as a moderator just stated because of my international relations and security background. In which case, I will try to address the nexus between ontological security and Jamaica's conduct of international relations and confidence in an independent foreign policy. I put this in the context of our confidence in self and our respect for and adherence to international law and norms, which place all states on an equal plane. International law provides protection for small states against the powerful who might wish to exercise power indiscriminately. And international law provides the basis for the conduct of international relations among all states. Professor J. L. Brierley, who is sometimes referred to as the father of international law and relations, in his classic book, Law of Nations, first published in 1928, and now in its eighth edition, on the conduct of international relations in a law-based system, stated international law is performing a useful and indeed a necessary function in international life, in enabling states to carry out their day-to-day -day intercourse along orderly and predictable lines. There are contrasting strengths and weaknesses, great disparities in economic and military capabilities, large and small countries, 
island states and contiguous states, varying political interests, geopolitical and security considerations, and a plethora of factors and challenges that affect how each government develops and maintains its international and bilateral relations. Jamaica's conduct of international relations takes place within this complex environment. And it is within this context that Jamaica is often punching above its weight. We often refer to our country, Jamaica, as we look at what we tell our. This is a mindset rather than a reality. We do not have military capabilities to defend the country against a hostile force. <laughs> we cannot protect our maritime space from illicit trafficking in drugs and guns. Our security is constantly under threat and we depend on our alliances to help protect us. We had grown accustomed to hearing Jamaica punches above its weight. Some may even have meant Jamaica is uppity. This was based on our ability as a small country to be proactive on important issues and being an effective voice on the right side of history as we defended certain core principles in our bilateral and international relations. This was our reality. But this was not by happenstance. This behavior is based on confidence in who we have chosen to be as a nation. It was Jamaica's national hero, Norman Manley, who was first to lead the international community in efforts to isolate apartheid South Africa. This bold step was a landmark decision which emboldened other countries and inspired succeeding Jamaican governments to carve out a world-leading role in the anti-apartheid movement, human rights advocacy, and in the advocacy for the freedoms of people under colonial and other forms of oppression, domination and occupation, and rights to self-determination for all peoples under the yoke of a superior and occupying power, for equity and fairness in the international trade and economic systems, and for reform of international financial institutions. We proved that a small country like Jamaica can be a leader in resolving difficult issues and can be effective, reliable, and trusted partner in international affairs. Global respect for Jamaica earned our country economic rewards accolades, and recognition. It opened doors for Jamaicans to serve in international organizations and institutions. Our past experiences and performances grew out of our own mindset and confidence in ourselves as Jamaicans. We believed in the phrase, we little but we tell them, and we acted accordingly. It was not without risk, but we took them, as in most activities in the normal affairs of a country. We do not limit ourselves to our size and limited resources. We have acted with confidence. We had a moral compass and we had integrity. Thus, Jamaican governments in the past were able to influence the conduct of international relations and decision-making on a plethora of critical global issues. In multilateral forum, 
we led on issues related to human security, on equity, equality, and justice. We led on gender equity and the protection of women and children. We led on issues of peace and security. And we were very impactful during our two-year term as member of the UN Security Council at the beginning of the century. Former Prime Minister P.J. Patterson memorialized our effectiveness in his book, My Political Journey. He said, in our most recent tenure on the UN Security Council, shrewd commentators marvel at how a country with such a small delegation could have been as effective in the Council's deliberations during 2000, 2001. As to the Security Council's action against terrorism in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 attacks, Mr. Patterson stated, and I quote, Jamaica's dominance among non-permanent members of the Security Council on these issues established new precedents and created new dynamics in the Council vis-a-vis -vis permanent and non-permanent members. And that during Jamaica's membership on the Security Council are principled and steadfast, sometimes uncompromising defense of justice, gender equity, human rights, the right to self-determination, and the end to impunity embolden other non-permanent members to stand up. We were secure in our confidence. I can attest to that record. It was my personal experience while representing Jamaica on the UN Security Council during those two years. Some significant historical developments in the Americas were highly influenced by the boldness of Jamaica's leaders in the 1970s. We defied the power to the North and embraced Cuba as a part of our Caribbean family. We robustly advocated for protection of human rights in Chile during the brutal Pinochet regime. We were in the forefront of efforts to return Panama's sovereignty over the Panama Canal. And we led in defense of the integrity of the territorial integrity. <clears throat> of beliefs removing barriers to that country's path to independence. We also stood in defiance of economic threats from the United States in strident support of Southern Africans in their struggle for freedom. As Jamaicans, we were confident in our defense of what was right, and we were prepared to suffer the consequences of our moral convictions. International respect for our country was because of the integrity and coherence of our foreign policy and our fearless conduct of international relations. We never kowtowed to powerful countries, and we did not shun difficult issues. We conducted international relations on our feet, not on our knees. It's best to be erect and correct. As a small nation, our achievements in sports and cultural expressions in music and our scholarship are natural extensions of the paradigm of confidence in self that we, as Jamaicans, have embraced. 
we have shown that we are not bound by the expectations of the international community. Thus, as a nation, Jamaica, its people at home and in the diaspora, is responsible to this and succeeding generations to live up to and reclaim the standards we have set in the past. Our political leaders must become aware of Jamaica's history, of our ontological security relating to our conduct of international relations. Let's be frank. Governments of Jamaica have had varying degrees of commitment to the core principles of our foreign policy. The public too often seems unperturbed those who are enriched to have otherwise benefited and continue to benefit from our past conduct of international relations do not seem to appreciate how and why our conduct of international relations has helped pave the way to their enrichment. There is an international relations context for the much talked about brand Jamaica. But recently, there has been an erosion of a robust defense of long held principles. There are inconsistencies, some say incompetencies, and a profound lack of appreciation for our past foreign policy. Successes. We have a history, an international relations history, that is the envy of countries far better endowed and with financial, human, and financial resources. But we are a unique people with a unique history, culture, and DNA. Friends, I'm old enough to recall that the history taught to me in high school proved to be lies created to shape our young minds in believing in the superiority of the imperial colonizers and former enslavers of our forefathers. We were dependent on them for our security not on ourselves. We were not allowed to question authority or motive, yet we managed to escape that orthodoxy and were able to believe that we little but we tell our and to develop a reputation of country above our weight internationally. How much latitude should students have to question the orthodoxy of what they're taught. Our personal, social, and cultural experiences limiting factors in who they can become. Or should they believe that despite their personal experiences, there's no limit to what they can achieve because of our mindset that we little but we tell our our foreign policy can be based merely on personal gratification or personal reward. It never used to be, perhaps because we were mostly descendants of former enslaved and colonized persons. We saw humanity through different lenses. We placed humanity at the center of our practice of international relations. We may be Harry Belafonte's island in the sun, but you are not alone in this world, and no man is an island. The strength of our foreign policy and our international relationships were based on certain precepts which we must embrace at the present. 
or our professor today and tomorrow is as relevant as it was yesterday. There is still slavery and human bondage, and the scourge of human trafficking is widespread. Human rights are denied to millions around the world with discrimination based on race, class, ethnicity, gender, religion, and sexual orientation. There are war crimes and genocide and crimes against humanity occurring every day. There is no true freedom for us unless all of humanity has the freedoms we desire for ourselves. Freedom from war, freedom from fear, freedom from bondage and oppression. Fanny Lou Hamer, the great American civil rights campaigner, said, nobody is free until everybody is free. The same applies to justice for all and not just for Jamaicans. Just injustice proliferates around the world. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. reminded us, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Jamaica has been, and again can be a catalyst for change on the international stage. Mahatma Gandhi, suggested we must be the change we want to see. But, but that change begins at home, in Jamaica, and with us. Our national hero, Marcus Masai Garvey, admonished us that none but ourselves can free our minds. We have developed that culture of free thinking and expressions. Sometimes we displease some by the principles we expose, but we are endowed with the spirit of our ancestors and firm belief that we listen what we tell them. We must revisit those basic values which guided the conduct of our international relations and the conduct of each other, one with the other. Those values are part of our ontological DNA. Those are standards by which we have defined ourselves. Standards underpinned by the confidence in our firm belief that we little but we follow. Ladies and gentlemen, many countries, big and small, have held Jamaica in very high regard and sought the advice and counsel and our support on many difficult international issues. It now seems we have forgotten who we are as Jamaica. We must recognize that we have achieved, that what we have achieved, we can do again, even if it means a renaissance in the way we see ourselves and the recalibration of our moral compass and our political will, how we perceive our ontological security. Thank you for listening. This is Retalk with Ambassador Curtis Ward.